other. So I would say for medium-sized specimens, that approach might work really quite well, something like that. You're really, you, know, you can sort of read most of the information. If you point mount specimens, which is what we do in North America with tiny little specimens, it becomes a problem because the point is obviously obscuring more. And if you go to you know, more European collections way, is you have these cards that would have the tiny little specimen sitting on them, you're obscuring even more. And obviously, if you have a specimen that's bigger than the label, and this would be true for you know, half of the organisms I work on, Vedividi or Sessenbergs, they're typically you know, at least that big. That approach will not really work. Okay, what about, um, what about solutions? And this is what the invert people have been thinking about, and it sounds like a really very smart thing to do, because when you're, as a systematist, you go to a collection, you look over specimens, you, you, know, you just pull a drawer out, you look at them. What you typically do is you tilt the drawer, just so you can actually see underneath the specimen a little bit and read more of the label. So sometimes you have to look at it from both sides, but typically you will see at least information on a top label without too much of a problem. So the internet people have been thinking, okay, we probably can do that with image capture from different perspectives and then have 3D images. So you can do a virtual tilting of the drawer. So that sounds really brilliant, I think. And this is what they've been coming up with. So they have what's called a delta robot. So you have the insect drawer down here. It's sort of a triangular stand. And then you have the camera up here. And the camera is moving over these drawers and um, taking different images, which is not too different, really, from what GigaPan has been doing. But then what's really quite different is that InvertNet is collaborating with engineers and um, bioinformatics or informatics people, in this case, and they're coming up with better algorithms of how to stitch these images together. So you're avoiding some of the distortion. And then they're using multi-view stereo reconstructions to come up with the 3D reconstructed images. So there's a hope for you know, quite a bit of the data out there that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Okay, so my sort of more negative thing is though, so in, in that article too, they look at what Giga handed initially and they say that looking at that North Carolina State Insect Collection indicates that more than 75% of the drawers and circa 90% of the specimens imaged have text on the top label visible. They don't really say if it's the entire text, which obviously would be different. And I think those estimates sound, they sound actually pretty good, and they sound, I think, a little bit higher than what I s typically see in the collections I work with. But then maybe that's just because of the interest I have in slightly larger specimens or in very tiny specimens that are card mounted. So, you know, it tells you there's hope for larger proportions of um, collections. What I'm saying here is you could probably image medium-sized specimens and then what you could maybe do is complement that with manual um, uh, data capture for the really large and the really small um, specimens. There's also another idea that's being floated in WordNet. I think it's not really realistic. They were thinking of using, or that in the future, people could use micro CT scans to actually capture the obscured label data. I think this is far in the future for now, but obviously you know, technology advances really quickly, so it might become a possibility. Okay, having said all that, think back to the specimens that have seven, eight labels stacked underneath them. So this approach still, if you want to capture all that information, obviously that approach will still not work. Okay, the second challenge really, or the, you know, actually we're third challenge now, I think, is how to capture the actual label data. Because at this point, you have a beautiful image of the drawer that you can you know, put online and people can look at it, but you, know, you don't have the data. And the second question would be how to assign USIs to individual specimens, really, if this is what you want to do. So this is a slide that was, um, comes from a presentation given by uh, Chris Dietrich, the lead PI on InvertNet. And this is how they're envisioning things. So you have an image of the entire drawer then you segment this image using image analysis software. And then you essentially kind of find each of the specimens and save them to separate files. So you really, you know, 
virtually dividing the drawer into the individual specimens. So you segment the images, and then in the end also, you will actually be assigning unique identifiers to each of these segments that you saved individually. Okay, which means you have a lot of specimens for draw, but you still don't have the data. And what happens then? So the initial idea was that optical character recognition software becomes better over time, obviously. And what seemed as a challenge at the beginning of the project would become feasible at some point, which is that for really tiny labels, optical character recognition becomes good enough so you can actually capture the um, information that you find on these labels. Well, there's a number of problems with that. First, in very many cases, and this is in particular true for the collection I work in, labels don't look like that. Labels are handwritten, and we have one of the worst person who worked for us for about 50 years, who collected lots of specimens, and unfortunately lots of, and I'm saying that in quotes, unfortunately lots of specimens of really extremely high quality, because he was also a very good botanist, knew his plants really well, and those are the majority of specimens for which we have really good host data. So there's no way we could ignore them. But there's also no way you could capture data like that with optical character recognition. Because even I still have problems deciphering his handwriting. And it always means for our undergrads, once they start being able to decipher some of his labels, we know they, they got it. They've gotten really good. So it's, you know, it's between the size of the labels, um, the fact that many of them are handwritten, and also the fact that many of them are less standardized, as you would see in other specimen type collections, is a real problem. So what Dietrich et al. are proposing now is what they're going to be doing or what they're trying to be doing is crowdsourcing. So you don't actually pay people, it's a very smart thing to do obviously, you don't pay people to capture your data, but you get volunteers out there to help you do that. And I will talk about it in a second. Okay, so to summarize, benefits of semi-automated digitization, it's very fast, obviously, and it's very low cost compared to what other projects are doing. I would also argue that technology is advancing very quickly. And um, a lot of the involved software, for example, to slice up your images into partitions. There is software out there that you can just freely download and use to do these kind of things. It's not really actually that expensive to do if you have the camera available. Current drawbacks, um, it doesn't work well for very large or very small um, specimens. You don't physically attach a specimen identifier. If this is important to you, then this is probably not the way to go. And at least at the moment, getting the actual data is, seems to be relatively slow, just because it, you know, getting started, getting the technology, getting the um, drawers imaged, all this needs to be done before the actual data capture um, can start. Okay, um, there's also some projects out there that use that in-between approach, I would say. So the uh, Kellbug project at the University of Berkeley, for example, um, they're imaging all their specimens. They're also taking off all the labels. So in this case, you see, you know, it's not too many, it's six labels, but they spread them all out. They take an image. They don't worry about data, the actual data capture at this point. So they train their undergrad students to just, you know, handle the specimens carefully, lay out all the labels in this way, you know, put their metrics up on top, and then collect the images and collect the images. And then they will, or they've started using crowdsourcing to actually transcribe the labels and get them into the database. So it's a good way in, in many ways because you obviously have the, ima uh, the image of the specimen and uh, the label um, together. Okay, um, just really briefly, um, citizen scientists and the whole crowdsourcing idea is if you want to read up a little bit more about that IDIC bio, this um, overarching project that helps all the ADBC projects and a larger community of databasers out there worldwide by now. Um, they've assembled a page specifically talking specifically about public participation and uh, digitization really. So there's a lot of um, stuff going on in that area. And I'm just going to be listing a few projects that have used crowdsourcing and a few, um, few examples really to show you how the whole thing um, could work really. 
So what you're seeing here, it's, um, and you can read through that when you actually have the slide. So there's very different approaches. So some of these crowdsourcing projects, they would essentially just you know, provide, um, essentially like, um, I can't remember, Melissa and Kim were talking about it yesterday, they would provide you with access to a very specific part of your database and really only allow you to you know, manipulate certain data in there. And it's really quite amazing that people out there can get excited about things, but there's a lot of people out there who don't, you know, they have not quite enough stuff to do, to put it that way. They like to get involved, they like to do something interesting, and you know, getting involved in biodiversity and discovery and exploration of things like that, this is something that people find interesting and exciting. So if you can get people's attention through certain web pages, this is a really good thing to do. Okay, so this is one example that's been going on for quite some time and um, that's actually really quite, uh, quite neat. So it's called um, the Atlas of Living Australia and they've been using volunteer people out there online to transcribe their data uh, for quite some time. So they always have little, you know, little things on what the project is all about. It's very project-based, so people can say like, oh, I'm interested in marine organisms, or I'm interested in this and that. So it's, it really tries to draw you in as a volunteer. And then also obviously you have, you know, showing who's doing best and little competition kind of thingies going on. So that's very important as well. Um, a quite different type of citizen science participation, and it's essentially crowdsourcing too, is uh, what's used a fair bit in North America by students and by professors as well is bug guides. So this is just essentially a platform where everyone can put up images. And then it's a really large community of entomologists who you know, look through these images and they annotate them and they just say what taxon that is. So typically you post them, you say this picture was taken in this and that um, county, this and that locality, this and that time of the year, by whom and then people will come and help you to actually identify things. So this is really cool. Obviously Flickr and other big image, um, um, image platforms start doing the same thing already, but Bug Diet is really dedicated to things. Obviously there's misidentifications up there, so you know, I, I always tell my students to not completely trust it, but it does give you um, some idea of what's, what's out there obviously. Okay, and then back to Kullbug, um, the project at the um, um, at a Essex Museum in Berkeley. So they were one of the, the first entomological projects that were really using um, volunteers to transcribe data. So again, this was this in-between approach of taking the images and then they asked people to transcribe that information from the images, from the labels into specific fields. And there are some guidelines in there that tells volunteers obviously how to do that. So there's some training involved as well. And um, the, um, the person who's been really pushing that, um, Peter Oboisky, he gave a really nice presentation at the last Entomological Collections Network meeting last November. And um, one of the things he observed, so he had all the statistics on their volunteers because you can see obviously how many people are involved and how many labels have they transcribed over time. And he put it together in a graphic so you could see big bubbles for those people who were transcribing a lot of data. And there were only really a few big bubbles. And then there were tons of people who did, you know, a few little things, but really not that much. So they felt, you know, this is obviously something to watch and you know, try to encourage those people who only start transcribing, but then don't keep going really and try to figure out what, what could make them become more persistent and contribute more and help out more. And um, so they started with that <laughs> earning badges. <laughs> um, um, it's essentially a game. It's like an online game. Um, to deal with that volunteer fatigue. So you can earn different badges as you go and transcribe more data. And I felt it's actually working. It sounds kind of silly to me in some ways, but you know, it, it seems to be really the right way to go. So you have to get people to understand it's both science, but it's also a game and it's a competition. And then if you get that thing across, people will get captured and, and help you out. Okay, this is it for me. So if you have any questions, please let me know, either now or later. And we're working on getting all the presentations we've been giving also over the last days that I haven't given to you yet. Sorry about that. So you have the links and the resources in there as well. Questions?